Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. The FBI warning older Americans to be careful online because losses for scam victims over 60 years old are soaring. We tell you how you can protect yourself. ICE is giving smartphones to illegal immigrants. That's so the immigrants can be tracked and also send geotagged photos of themselves to the agency. A tense debate in Ohio as two candidates trade barbs to determine who heads to the U.S. Senate and who stays home. The New York Times has updated an article on an election software company. The company is facing charges for stealing and storing data on servers in China. The Supreme Court just ruled that Pennsylvania doesn't have to count mail-in ballots if there isn't a date on the envelope. The decision vacates a previous ruling by a court of appeals. The case centers around David Ritter, an unsuccessful Republican candidate for county judge. Ritter lost his 2021 bid after just over 250 mail-in ballots that didn't have dates were counted. The Supreme Court also overturned the ruling that allowed the county to count those ballots. It doesn't change Richard's loss in the case, but it does mean that it can't be used as a precedent. Three states could have done so, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Now they can't use it as an example to approve the counting of ballots with minor flaws, such as the voter failing to fill in the date. Conservative commentator and venture capitalist J.D. Vance and Democrat Representative Tim Ryan battled on Monday. The two Ohio Senate candidates met for a televised debate, and today's Daniel Monahan has the story. Vance, a Republican, and Ryan, a Democrat, faced off on various topics such as inflation, abortion, Russia's war on Ukraine, China, and law enforcement. Vance is the author of Hard Knocks memoir, Hillbilly Elegy. Ryan attended high school in Warren, Ohio, where he played football as a quarterback and later coached junior high basketball. Ryan, who was once against abortion, pledged to try and codify legal access to it. He called the overturning of Roe versus Wade. The largest governmental overreach in the history of our lifetime. Complete violation of personal freedom and liberty of women in this state. When asked if he would support a 15-week national abortion ban, Vance acknowledged that he is pro-life but believes a minimum national standard is appropriate. He then made reference to second trimester abortions legal in many states. We're talking about five-month-old babies, fully formed babies who can feel pain. No civilized country in the world allows elective abortion that late in pregnancy. I don't think the United States should be an exception. On inflation, Vance accused the Biden administration of mismanagement and Ryan of voting for those policies. Simultaneously, they borrowed and spent trillions of dollars that we just don't have, and that's thrown fuel on the flyer, fire of the inflation problem. He continued that the administration has also gone to war against America's energy sector and concluded that those are each bad ideas, but when done together, have resulted in record inflation. Ryan countered that Vance has played his own role in the economic woes as a venture capitalist. The problem we're having now with inflation is our supply chains all went to China. And guys like him have made a lot of money off that. Meanwhile, Trump endorsed J.D. Vance accused Ryan of not doing enough to prevent illegal migration. He called attention to the rape of an 11-year-old who sought an abortion in Indiana. According to Vance, the girl was assaulted by an illegal alien who should never have been here. He accused Ryan of voting against funding to protect the border. When asked about how the U.S. should respond if Russia's Putin started a nuclear war in Ukraine, Ryan called for an aggressive response while Vance called for a de-escalation of the conflict. The 2022 midterm elections will be held on Tuesday, November 8th. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. The office of the Colorado Secretary of State says it made a mistake in sending out postcards encouraging voter registration to 30,000 non-citizens. The move was harshly criticized. Secretary of State Jenna Griswold's office says the non-citizens won't be able to register to vote if they attempt to. Griswold has promoted herself as a national advocate for secure elections. The head of the state's Republican Party issued a statement saying that Griswold continues to make easily avoidable errors just before ballots go out. Griswold is a Democrat who is seeking re-election during the upcoming midterm elections. Her office says the postcards went out on September 27th and says the error happened when staff compared names provided by the Electronic Registration Information Center with a database of state residents with driver's licenses. Colorado issues driver's licenses to non-citizens. And also in election news, the New York Times is updating an article about an election software company after the CEO of the company was charged for stealing data and storing it on servers in China. Let's take a look. The New York Times on October 3rd published an article 
claiming that conspiracy theorists and election deniers are targeting a small Michigan-based election software company called Connick. The next day, the Los Angeles district attorney announced charges against Connick CEO Eugene Yu. He's accused of stealing and storing L.A. County election worker data on servers in China. Yu was arrested in Michigan. The New York Times article focused on an election integrity group called True the Vote. The article called them a group of election deniers and said, quote, using threadbare evidence or none at all, the group suggested that a small American election software company, Connick, had secret ties to the Chinese Communist Party and had given the Chinese government backdoor access to personal data about two million poll workers in the United States. The author, Stuart A. Thompson, concluded that the group's allegations, quote, demonstrate how far-right election deniers are also giving more attention to new and more secondary companies and groups. Following the arrest of the Connick CEO, the New York Times added an editor's note to their article. The note says, in communication with the Times for this article, neither Mr. Yu nor a spokesman for Connick said that the company was the subject of an investigation. They also asserted that all the company's data was stored on servers in the United States. The Times is continuing to report on this story. Governments around the country are reconsidering their contracts with Connick. The company lost contracts with Detroit and Fairfax County, Virginia, but the elections board of DeKalb County, Georgia, voted to continue its contract and downplayed the risks. In Texas, another case about election integrity, a political consultant is convicted of coercion. His scheme focused on a state-level race in Harris County in 2020. The Democratic consultant Damian Jones anonymously sent threatening text messages to then-state representative Gina Kalani. A district judge said the messages were designed to get Kalani to resign and not run for re-election. The judge added that Jones made the threats just days before the 2020 election filing deadline. Jones has worked as a political director for former Congressman Beto O'Rourke. He also worked with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. His attorney argued that his client's constitutional rights were violated and the law against threats is written incorrectly. If you or a loved one are 60 years or older, listen up. The FBI is warning that scammers are increasingly targeting older Americans online and losses were way up last year compared to the year before. Entity's Jessica Beatty has more on the numbers and tips to protect against being scammed. When the pandemic hit, people were pushed increasingly online. It seems scammers around the world took it as a golden opportunity to go after America's retirees. According to the FBI's 2021 Elder Fraud Report, over 92,000 victims over 60 years old reported losses last year. Those losses added up to $1.7 billion. That's up 74 percent compared to the year before. The FBI says the average dollar loss per victim was over $18,000. Thousands of victims lost over $100,000. The most reported fraud was tech support fraud. Scammers impersonate well-known tech companies and offer to help fix non-existent tech issues. More and more scammers are impersonating customer support, according to the FBI. Another big one is confidence fraud. That includes romance scams and grandparent scams. Criminals gain a victim's affection or impersonate a panicked loved one like a grandchild and then start asking for money. Victims lost the most money in these types of scams. Other types of fraud include lottery scams, government impersonation, and investment fraud. These scams are not going unnoticed. Earlier this month, the DOJ said it's adding 14 U.S. attorneys' offices to its transnational elder fraud strike force. That means it's more than tripling the number of offices. So how can you protect yourself? The FBI's top tip? Resist the pressure to act quickly. Scammers create a sense of urgency and want you to act right away. Update software, never give out personal information or money to people who only reached out to you online. And if you get suspicious pop-ups or a locked screen, disconnect from the internet and turn off the device. And stop communicating with the scammer, but expect that they'll keep trying to contact you. If you do encounter a scam, report it to the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center and contact your local FBI field office. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Homeland Security agencies like ICE are giving smartphones to thousands of illegal immigrants. That's so they can check in with ICE and send geotagged photos of themselves. 
Department of Homeland Security agencies have issued over 250,000 smartphones to illegal immigrants during fiscal year 2022. The phones are trackable and the immigrants are responsible for checking in with ICE on a regular basis, often by sending in a geotag photo of themselves. ICE began issuing the smartphones within the past year as border stations became overwhelmed and agents started processing illegal immigrants faster and in larger numbers. They created a new form of parole. This allows foreigners who wouldn't otherwise be admissible to the country to live in the United States temporarily. Under this parole status, illegal immigrants don't have to provide Border Patrol with evidence for an asylum claim and are permitted entry without any preconditions, except a quick background check in the U.S. crime database. The Immigration and Nationality Act states that by law, parole is designed to be used on a case-by-case -case basis and for urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit. A CBP spokesman previously told the Epic Times that the parole designation allows for overwhelmed Border Patrol stations to process and release large numbers of illegal aliens significantly faster than the more involved traditional system. In an email to NTD, ICE wrote that the devices given out do not have internet access or the ability to make phone calls. They are used solely for participation in the parole program. The agency said they allow supervising officers and case managers to keep participants focused on the conditions of release. Still to come, inflation stimulus checks. California is set to give out $1,000 each to tens of millions of residents. An analyst says this will help recipients, but may add inflationary pressures. And updates on a big tech censorship case. Two state attorneys general are seeking depositions of top Biden administration officials. We bring you expert analysis in just a moment here on NTD News Today. On to legal challenges surrounding social media censorship. State attorneys general from Missouri and Louisiana are asking a Trump-appointed judge to depose top government officials. The AGs alleged the Biden administration was deeply involved in censoring users on big tech platforms. Our next guest outlines how these depositions could play out. Joining us now is Mike Davis, the founder and president of the Article 3 Project and the Internet Accountability Project. Mike is also the former chief counsel for nominations to Senate Judiciary Chairman Chuck Grassley. Pleasure having you on the show, Mike. Thank you for having me. I would really like to know if it's actually possible for top government officials such as President Joe Biden and Dr. Anthony Fauci to be deposed, or do they have some sort of immunity that would allow them to avoid testifying? It's certainly possible for uh, almost all government officials to be deposed in lawsuits. Uh, the president is treated differently. Uh, the president uh, does enjoy uh, some immunity from depositions while he is uh, serving in office. It's not absolute. Uh, we saw with Bill Clinton in the Paula Jones case back in 1998 that it's possible for the president to have to testify in courts on cases, but it's rare and it's uh, it would be a very, very heightened standard when you deal with the president because it would be uh, it would be such a distraction for the president of the United States. He is the executive under the Constitution. You mentioned former presidents. What is the precedent to a case like this? Well, this is I mean, the state AGs have brought, brought lawsuits against the federal government overreach many, many times. What's so impressive about this lawsuit from uh, Missouri Attorney General Eric Smith and Louisiana Attorney General Jeff Landry, along with several doctors, uh, a journalist Jim Hoff from Gateway Pundit, uh, uh, just everyday Americans, is they're really pushing back against the Biden administration's clearly unconstitutional uh, uh, censorship of Americans under the guise of COVID misinformation and disinformation. And what this lawsuit clearly lays out is this was a government wide enterprise across the Biden administration, across many departments and agencies. Uh, and it's clearly illegal under the First Amendment what they have done. They are colluding with these big tech monopolists to Google, uh, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter. They're colluding with these big tech platforms to censor Americans. And the reason these big tech tech platforms are doing it is they have Section 230 immunity. This this tremendous benefit from the federal government where they cannot get sued for what people post on their platforms. And the government threatens their Section 230 immunity and, and threatens their uh, antitrust amnesty if they do, don't do gov the government's censorship. Uh, they don't do the government's bidding. And this is a clear First Amendment violation. And, it, and it's very good 
that the, the, the Louisiana and the Missouri state attorneys general have brought these lo this lawsuit. It has been hard to get a statement from the other side. The FBI declined to comment. The other agencies have not responded to comments. How significant would it be if President Biden or any of the others were made to testify? I mean, it's pretty clear that these other officials can testify and they probably will testify. This is potentially illegal conduct on their part. What they're doing, they're conspiring to deprive Americans of their constitutional rights, their civil rights, uh, and so it's uh, this is this is uh, th this is pretty damning. If this turns out to be true, what they're alleging in this lawsuit, this is very damning evidence, and the courts need to step in and end this censorship re regime immediately. It's clearly unconstitutional. It's clearly illegal. The government is colluding with big tech platforms to censor Americans, and it is damaging. And we. They have shown repeatedly that this that this so-called misinformation, disinformation ends up being correct. We saw this with mask mandates. We saw this with Hunter Biden's laptop. We've seen this in instant after instant after instant where the left claims misinformation and disinformation, and it ends up being true. Well, we're definitely going to keep a close eye on this. Mike Davis, the founder and president of the Article 3 Project, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Some states, like Georgia and Colorado, are putting tax money back in their residents' pockets to counter rising prices. Tens of millions of Californians are set to get up to about $1,000. We hear from an analyst who breaks this down for us. Joining us now is Robert Hughes, Senior Research Faculty at the American Institute for Economic Research. Great to have you with us today, Robert. Oh, thanks, Kevin. It's great to be here. California, along with several other states, is sending out inflation relief stimulus checks. What are the pros and cons of this initiative? There's actually a few things that need to be considered. From California's point of view, of course, what's their financial position? Uh, California, I think, is running a, a budget surplus, so that's that's a good sign. So they, they have the means to do this. Um, you have to ask whether this is really the most efficient use of their money. What other... Um, obligations they might have, underfunded liabilities, uh, how their infrastructure is doing. So from their point of view, it's, it's a complicated decision. Um, from a consumer's point of view, you know, I'm sure it's good to receive some money to offset some of these high prices. Okay, so you mentioned from the state and from the public's point of view. Now, do you think this will ultimately help or hurt Americans who are struggling with these rising prices? I'm, I'm almost certain it will help the people getting it. I believe there's income tests on it. So the people who are receiving these uh, stimulus checks are, are going to be um, the most impacted by the inflation we've seen. So for their point of view, it, it's going to be helpful. And it, you know, to the extent it can help them from taking on more, more credit card debt and, and worsening their own financial position, it's probably beneficial. So these aren't the first stimulus checks we've seen in this era of inflation, the pandemic, for example. During lockdowns, people weren't able to work. The federal government also sent out stimulus checks. How did these measures impact inflation that we see today? And are there any lessons we can learn from this? Well, it's, it, you know, it, it is somewhat debatable, but I mean, certainly the, the massive stimulus checks we've gotten contributed to some of the inflation we're seeing now. I think it's a, a bit of a perfect storm in that the lockdown recessions disrupted production. Um, you know, consumers, they, they were out of work for a while, but then they got all this money in there. Uh, we saw a surge in, in spending by consumers once sort of the lockdown recession was, was over. Um, you know, it's hard to get it just right uh, from the government's point of view. I mean, you need to help people in, a, in a, something so unprecedented like a lockdown recession, and we've just never experienced anything like that. Um, on the other hand, you run the risk of, of these unforeseen um, impacts and, and the inflation has been a big problem. The inflation checks will help the, the certainly the recipients. I mean, if they're struggling with in California, their gas prices are over seven dollars a gallon, and that's before you know any impacts from the recently announced OPEC cut. So, um, and there's a number of things contributing to that. I understand there's a bunch of refineries that are undergoing um, some routine maintenance. So there's you know typical supply demand issues. Um, but it, stimulus checks for people who are, are hurting is, is a good thing. And again, it keeps them from going further into debt uh, through uh, credit cards, which they might use to just meet their basic necessities. Bob, you mentioned that the recipients are going to benefit from these checks. But now what are the cons to this program? Well, the cons are, are extra inflationary pressures. If you've got uh, extra dollars chasing a limited supply of goods, then you're going to drive prices higher. And we did see a lot of disruption to production uh, from the fallout of the lockdown recession. 
And so what advice do you have for Americans right now and, and the who, ones that are receiving these checks and also others that aren't? Well, I, I think everybody just has to be as prudent as they can with their own finances. It's not easy to deal with rising uh, inflation, in, uh, particularly for necessities and basics of life. Um, you know, be as prudent as you can, um, cut back where you need to, and, and just to hopefully uh, the policies that are being put in place are going to help ease these inflationary pressures and we can get back uh, to a little bit more normal environment. Well, hopefully that comes sooner than later. Robert Hughes at the American Institute for Economic Research. Pleasure speaking with you today. Thanks, Kevin. It's great to be here. You might be seeing higher prices at the post office soon. The U.S. Postal Service has proposed price hikes to offset inflation. First class stamps would cost three cents more and mailing a postcard would increase by four cents. The agency is also looking to increase fees for P.O. box rentals, money orders and insurance. The governors of the U.S. Postal Service already approved the hikes, and the Postal Regulatory Commission will review the proposal. If approved, the changes take effect in January. In other news, the California drought is pushing up food prices. A lack of rain and snow and a shrinking Colorado River have reduced summer crops. Here's more. California's historic drought has threatened crops, driving up prices on produce and putting another strain on budgets already stretched thin by inflation. You know, a tomato crop will take about 24 to 28 inches of water to grow the way we're doing it. And uh, if we don't have that water, uh, we just won't grow it. Aaron Barcelos planted just a quarter of the 2,000 acres of his family's fourth generation farm in Central California. This This summer, he harvested tomatoes two weeks early to prevent further drought damage. He says this year's tomato crop is only 10 to 15 percent of what it would normally be. Right now we're in a field that we're harvesting probably two weeks early because um, the heat has just brought it on sooner and these tomatoes are starting to go bad where they're they're not going to be usable if we don't get them off pretty soon. Central California, an area known as the U.S. Salad Bowl, has suffered from a lack of rain and snow, and restrictive water supplies from the Colorado River have withered summer crops like tomatoes and onions. Leafy greens grown in winter are also threatened, with no end in sight. The rise in food prices in 2022 helped drive U.S. inflation to its highest levels in 40 years. California's drought on top of Hurricane Ian ravaging citrus and tomato crops in Florida, is likely to push food costs even higher. Our Greg Pruitt is a sales and energy manager at Ingomar Packing Company, a tomato product supplier. As the crop gets shorter and shorter, there becomes times when you have to have conversations with customers about not being able to pack uh, their entire volume, uh, which is something that we very much like to avoid. But in situations like this, when you know, you're dealing with mother nature and she doesn't cooperate, then you know, sometimes those are tough conversations that you need to have. The most recent drought in California began in 2020, worsening with the Central Valley's driest January and February in recorded history. ExxonMobil has been ordered to reinstate two scientists who were fired for allegedly leaking information to the media. A federal whistleblower investigation found the energy giant terminated the two scientists illegally in late 2020. The two unidentified employees were allegedly suspected of providing company data to the Wall Street Journal. In an article published last year, the journal reported that ExxonMobil might have inflated the value of its oil and gas wells in Texas. The U.S. Department of Labor called ExxonMobil's actions unacceptable. The oil and gas giant was ordered to pay $800,000 in back wages, interest, and compensatory damages to the two employees. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, Russians are fleeing to Kazakhstan by the hundreds of thousands, but they're facing new problems on arrival. And victims of the Thai daycare massacre are prepared for a funeral service while the government announces new crime measures. We'll have the details soon when we return. At The Nation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. 
our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. As Americans, it seems like other people have been telling us what to do, how to live, and how to think. But that's not how we founded the greatest nation on Earth. During times of powerlessness, we found power. And we found power through taking action. Through action, we find solutions. And through solutions, we find freedom. The supply shortage has made it harder than ever to keep your shooting skills sharp at the range. Introducing Strikeman, a laser firearm training system that allows you to practice your shooting skills at home without wasting a dime on ammo. Using our laser cartridge, target, phone mount, and award-winning phone app, become a proficient shooter in under two weeks. Create training templates with firearm drills and get live feedback with progress tracking on your shot accuracy and shot times. Beat personal records and compete with friends and family to crown the best shooter in the group. Put the power back in your hands with Strikeman. The lasting beauty of realistic oil painting. Brilliant, expressive, and inspirational. The 6th NTD International Figure Painting Competition. Guided by pure authenticity, beauty, and goodness. Invites you to join us on a journey back to traditional art. The gold award is $10,000. For more details, please visit oilpainting.ntdtv.com. Welcome back. Lebanon and Israel have reached a historic agreement. They finally demarcated a disputed maritime border following years of U.S.-mediated negotiations. The deal still needs to be officially approved by both countries. It's meant to resolve a territorial dispute in the eastern Mediterranean Sea over an area Lebanon wants to explore for natural gas. Israel is already producing natural gas at fields nearby. The deal would set a border between Lebanese and Israeli waters for the first time and also establish a way for both countries to get royalties from an offshore gas field that straddles the boundary. Officials also say the deal is endorsed by the heavily armed Iran-backed Lebanese group Hezbollah. Until recently, the group has threatened to attack Israeli gas facilities. A gas find would be a major boon for Lebanon, which has been mired in financial crisis since 2019. It could fix Lebanon's long-standing failure to generate enough electricity for its population. An Israeli official said the final approval is expected within the next three weeks. Some Russians are opposed to the war in Ukraine, and others are afraid of being sent there to fight. They have fled to Kazakhstan in the hundreds of thousands, but many are finding new problems on arrival. Which countries have Russians been fleeing to? Since the 21st of September, when President Vladimir Putin announced a partial mobilization, Russians that are either opposed to the war in Ukraine or scared of being drafted to fight in it have been piling across the border. One destination has been Kazakhstan, which shares the world's longest land border with Russia and where Russians can enter without a passport or a visa. People fleeing have arrived in the hundreds of thousands in the last few weeks. However, many are faced with issues when they get there. The cost of housing has soared due to the massive Russian influx, and some have been accused by their families back home of betraying their country. Some Kazakhs view the incoming Russians as a potential economic burden and even a security risk. To be honest, I'm concerned because I don't know who's coming in or how they think, because they only started coming over after the so-called partial mobilization was declared. The process should be regulated, and as a last resort, there should be controls introduced that would shut the border completely. Kazakh officials estimate that more than 200,000 Russians have entered the country since Putin's announcement, and around 80,000 have registered in Kazakhstan's national ID system, a prerequisite for getting a job or a bank account. Ider Buribayev started thinking about leaving immediately after Putin's announcement, but what finally convinced him was seeing Moscow, for centuries a crucible of raw, bustling energy, so subdued and deserted. 
The final straw was driving through Moscow and suddenly realizing there were no traffic jams and seeing my co-working office almost empty. Russians have also been fleeing to Georgia, where they can also enter without a visa. Turkey, a popular tourist destination for Russians, and many have been heading to Europe. The EU saw a surge in arrivals after Putin's announcement. Some 66,000 Russian citizens entered the bloc, according to data from the bloc's border agency Frontex. Russian media has put the number of Russians that have fled the country at 700,000. Putin's spokesman Dmitry Peskov could give no precise number, but said the number was far from what was being claimed. China's ambassador to the United States thanked Elon Musk for proposing a special administration zone for Taiwan. But Taiwan's de facto ambassador to Washington told the billionaire that its freedom and democracy are not for sale. Elon Musk has suggested tensions between China and Taiwan could be resolved by handing some control to Beijing. Musk was responding to questions about China, where his Tesla electric car company operates a large factory in Shanghai. The world's richest man also said he believed conflict over Taiwan was inevitable and warned of the potential impact on the wider global economy. Beijing has long vowed to bring Taiwan under its control and has not ruled out using force to do so. It currently views the democratically ruled island as one of its provinces, but Taiwan, which is home to 23 million people, strongly objects to China's sovereignty claims, and the Chinese communist regime has never ruled the island. China previously offered Taiwan a one-country, two-systems model of autonomy like Hong Kong, but it has been rejected by all mainstream political parties and has no public support. And over in Southeast Asia, Malaysia will be holding an early election. The country's prime minister dissolved parliament on Monday. This comes ahead of the expiration of the parliament's five-year term in July 2023. The Malaysian Election Commission will determine the date of the general election. It must take place within 60 days of the dissolution of parliament. The prime minister also called for the dissolution of state assemblies and to have state elections be held at the same time as the general election. He said the dissolved parliament to put a stop to all the voices questioning the legitimacy of the alleged backdoor government. A total of 222 parliamentary seats will be contested in the general election. Hundreds of mourners and victims' families gathered today in Thailand to bid farewell to the young children and others who died in last week's mass killing. Thai Prime Minister Prayuth Chanocha on Monday ordered law enforcement agencies to tighten gun ownership rules and crack down on drug use following the massacre that left the nation in shock. These volunteers were somber as they layered bricks at Ratsamaki Temple in Thailand's northeastern Nongbualampu province on Monday. They were building funeral pyres to be used for cremating the bodies of victims slain in a mass killing at a daycare centre last Thursday. They were building a total of 19 pyres. Some other families chose to transport their loved ones back to their hometowns instead of taking part in the cremation planned for Tuesday evening. The gun and knife attack last week in Utai Sawan, a town 310 miles northeast of the capital Bangkok, claimed the lives of 36 people. At least 24 of them were children. The attacker, identified as 34-year-old former police sergeant Panya Kamlap, killed himself after his rampage. Police said he had been discharged over drug allegations and was facing trial on a drugs charge. On Monday, Thai Prime Minister Prayu Chanocha ordered law enforcement agencies to tighten gun control and crack down on drug use. In a statement, a government spokesman said Prayut ordered authorities to proactively search and test for the use of illicit drugs among officials and communities and step up treatment for addicts. And over in South America, Peru is showcasing what it has achieved in its crackdown on illegal drugs. Authorities say they burned 16 tons of confiscated drugs on Monday. The drugs were seized and operations carried out between July and September. Footage from Peru's Interior Ministry shows officials in coverall suits throwing bags containing white powder into ovens. The country's Interior Vice Minister led the activity. He said over 80 percent of the confiscated drugs is cocaine. He also thanked Peru's National Police for their hard work in seizing the drugs. This was the third time this year that drugs seized by the Peruvian National Police were burned. And just ahead, Scotland's first minister wants to continue the push for independence from Great Britain. 
And Switzerland is seeking to push ahead with solar power and increase energy security at what cost to the national environment. To the Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon said Monday that a second referendum on independence will happen in October next year if Britain's top court approves. While speaking at the Scottish National Party Conference in Aberdeen, Sturgis made the case for an independent Scotland. Whether it's Tory or Labour, Labour or Tory, it's not us who gets to decide. Our votes don't determine who gets to occupy number 10. For Scotland, the problem is not just which party is in power at Westminster. The problem is Westminster. The Supreme Court today begins hearing arguments for allowing a succession vote without approval from Prime Minister Liz Truss and her government. In a 2014 vote, which the government approved, 55 percent of Scots rejected independence. Sturgeon argues that as voters backed pro-independence parties in elections last year, there is a mandate to bring forward a bill to hold a referendum. The First Minister says she would respect the decision of the court. Now over to Austria, where President Alexander von der Bellen secured a second six-year term in office on Sunday. Here are the details. Austria's president is set to stay in office for a second six-year term. Alexander von der Bellen won a clear majority of votes and will be able to avoid a runoff, according to projections based on almost all votes cast. 78-year-old von der Bellen is a former leader of the Greens and has built his image on having a steady hand and a relaxed manner, garnering broad popularity for projecting calm during times of national crisis. And he's seen his fair share of crises, including the collapse of the government in 2019 and the resignation of Austria's chancellor a year ago. The Austrian presidency is largely a ceremonial role, but does have sweeping powers that involve overseeing periods of transition and turbulence. The president is also the commander-in-chief of the army and can sack the government or chancellor. A regional election in one of Germany's largest states indicates a slight shift to the right. The Social Democrats' bid score, did score a clear win, but their coalition partner, the Free Democrats, did not. The Free Democrats called the Lower Saxony result a blow and put much of the blame on the party being part of the federal government, which isn't very popular. The result delivered mixed fortunes for German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who's in the Social Democrat Party. Some experts say the defeat of the coalition partner risks destabilizing his government, even while support for his party is strong. The other clear winner in Lower Saxony was the right-wing alternative for Germany, nearly doubling its share of the vote. The result reflects a broad upsurge in support for the party across the country. It's likely driven by frustration over the cost-of-living crisis and the war in Ukraine. Now to the energy crisis in Europe. Switzerland is moving ahead with plans to boost its energy security, but only reluctantly. Here's the story. As the energy crisis looms over Europe, Switzerland is looking at homegrown energy. But could that affect its picture-perfect Alps? A focus on hydropower has helped shelter the Swiss from soaring oil and gas costs compared to others. But the country is far from immune. So the government is pushing to pivot away from fossil fuels and ramp up renewable energy output. That means using the Alps' unique geography to develop solar power and expand hydropower. I think in our country, especially also with the Alps, we can produce solar power for winter in the Alps. And we have all the huge potential to have solar power on our, on our uh, buildings. Mm-hmm. So if we can use solar power and hydropower today, this is, I think, really the dream team of uh, Swiss energy production. A successful pivot to a clean, independent energy supply would help cement Switzerland's position as a high-end economy at the heart of Europe. But implementing change isn't easy. Locals are worried about disruptions to biodiversity or blighting the overall landscape of the postcard-ready Alps. And Switzerland's system of direct democracy means projects can be blocked at the local level. It can take years to even get approval to raise a wall on an existing dam. New legislation will help approve large solar projects in the mountains, but it's up to the cantons or provinces to approve them. Switzerland's potential to harness energy from its own resources is on full display in Valais. This 935-foot-tall dam holds 400 million cubic meters of water, which can supply around 400,000 houses for a year. 
We all know that the coming winter is going to be pretty tense in terms of electricity supply. Uh, we are going to keep as much water as we can uh, to go through the winter. Uh, Switzerland is putting in place what they call a water reserve. So we're going to actually physically store water, keep water in the dams uh, for late in the winter to make sure that we are not in a, in a tight spot. Renewables currently take up a quarter of Switzerland's total energy supply. That puts it ahead of leading economies like Germany and France, but it lags behind Norway and Iceland, according to OECD data. If you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, Japan is reopening for tourism, but it's facing setbacks. Locals don't seem prepared to accept a new mass of tourists. And a story about a remarkable cheerleader who can't jump, dance, or cheer, but she's as encouraging as your typical cheerleaders, if not more. Get the full story right after this break. Take a look at these age spots. They seem to vanish right before your eyes. Oh my God! If you want to see blemishes seem to disappear in seconds for a flawless complexion, you can't get this look with regular old-fashioned makeup. So to get results like this and look years younger instantly, we have big news. At Luminous, we've taken our airbrush and now made it so easy for every day. Introducing Breeze, our all-new cordless handheld two-in-one airbrush system that applies makeup and skincare faster and easier than anything you've ever tried before. Putting the drops in. Just mm -hmm. hit the button real simple. Mm -hmm. So wow. easy. It knows exactly where it needs to blend and where it needs to go. The makeup you're using can look dry and cakey and can make your skin look rough. But with Breeze, you can go from this to this. The secret is how our premium foundations blend onto the skin with an ultra-fine mist using the power of air. Very little foundation is needed. Up to 10 times less makeup compared to what you're using. But you're also getting three times more coverage at the same time. That's maximum coverage using less makeup. It's clear. Traditional makeup can make you look older, while Breeze is specially designed for maturing skin, helping it to look smooth and so much younger. It's your anti-aging, moisturizing primer, concealer, and foundation, all in one simple step. And with so many shades, we give you a color match guarantee, so you're guaranteed the perfect shade that's just right for you. We're so confident you're going to love our all-new, best-ever two-in-one handheld airbrush system. We give you a full 30-day money-back guarantee. Call or go online and use this special promo code right now so you can get Breeze, our all-new handheld two-in-one airbrush to try at home for only $19.95. And you'll even get free shipping. There is a new and exciting way to look dramatically younger with Breeze. Luminous is not available in stores. You can only get this exclusive offer here. So don't wait. Order your new cordless handheld Breeze now. Call 800-451-9044 or go to getbreeze.com. Order now. After two years of pandemic isolation, Japan is finally opening its doors to visitors. However, hopes for a tourism boom face an uphill battle with a lack of hospitality workers and bolted up shops. Here's more. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is banking on tourism to help stimulate the economy and reap some benefits from the yen slide to a 24-year low. Arata Sawa is among those keen for the return of foreign tourists who used to make up nearly 90% of the guests at his inn. People from abroad will be able to come here as independent tourists from the 11th. I'm hoping and anticipating that a lot of foreigners will come to Japan, just like how it was before COVID. When the COVID pandemic started, the kind of guests that Soanoya had been receiving, individual travelers, were suddenly unable to enter Japan. So, up until now, we've basically been in a situation where we've had zero visitors. A mere half a million people have come to Japan so far this year, stark in comparison to the whopping 32 million in 2019. Spending from tourists will only reach around 2 trillion yen, that's 13 billion dollars, by 2023 and won't exceed pre-COVID levels until 2025, according to a report by the Nomura Research Institute. British in-guest Jenny Owen hopes foreign travellers will respect Japan's mask on etiquette. I worry for Japan in that way and I hope that people can come here and be respectful about the measures that, that Japan are putting on in, whether 
it seems like the right measure to us or not, we have to respect it and do what they say. Flag carrier Japan Airlines has seen inbound bookings triple since the border easing announcement. When you think of cheerleaders, what comes to your mind? Acrobatics, dancing and cheering. Well, the cheerleader you're about to meet can't do any of that. She cheers in her own special way. Let's take a look. Tristan is not your ordinary cheerleader. The soccer team's number one fan sits quietly on the sidelines, but her smile is just as encouraging as a group of cheerleaders. When Tristan gets to the games, everyone gets so excited. We just love her. She smiles at us. Tristan Rieger suffers from severe cerebral palsy. She can't move, talk, or eat by herself, but she's lucky to have a devoted younger sister. 21-year-old Sierra Rieger takes care of Tristan. She also takes Tristan with her when she goes to work as an assistant soccer coach at Greenwood Christian Academy in Indiana. Family on three! One, two, three, family! The sister's mother died in a traffic accident 18 years ago when Tristan was eight. Sierra was three and their oldest sister was 10. Their mother's sudden death changed their childhood. A lot of kids saw that as me being a kid with no mom and having the weird sister on the side. When Sierra was 12, she became Tristan's primary caretaker after their older sister moved away. Every day, Sierra dresses Tristan, feeds and bathes her, and gives her medicine when her dad and stepmom are at work. But when she became a teenager, Sierra resented having to care for Tristan. I was pretty upset with my parents because I always felt like that I was always left out, I always had to stay home, that I couldn't go and live a, a normal kid, teenage life. Now at 21, Sierra understands the importance of taking care yeah. of Tristan. And that was just me being young and immature and not thinking she's my sister. There's nobody else that can do this, so this is what you should do, step up as a sister, because when you're in a family, you take care of your family. Because Sierra wanted Tristan to enjoy life more, she asked her boss to include her sister on the team. She's our cheerleader. She's really on the sides cheering on the girls. If she could talk, Tristan might tell you Sierra has changed her life. But Sierra says it's the other way around. It made me view life differently because if I wouldn't have her, I don't think I would have such a soft spot for those who are different and grow. While Tristan may not be your typical cheerleader, her presence brings out the best in those around her. Reporting by Angela Moy, NTD News, Greenwood, Indiana. The record for the heaviest pumpkin ever grown in the U.S. has been broken. A horticulture teacher from Minnesota raised a giant gourd weighing 2,560 pounds. That is special. I really wanted that. I never dreamed of that. And uh, to have it, to even be mentioned in that conversation is really cool. Travis Ginger of Anoka, Minnesota, set a new record and won an annual pumpkin weighing contest in Northern California. He drove 35 hours carrying the giant pumpkin to the 49th World Championship Pumpkin Weigh-Off in Half Moon Bay, south of San Francisco. Ginger also won the same contest in Northern California in 2020, and he broke a record set last week in New York where a grower raised a massive pumpkin weighing 2,554 pounds. According to Guinness World Records, a grower in Italy holds the world record for the heaviest pumpkin. He grew a 2,700-pound squash in 2021. There's no better way to celebrate spooky season than with a full moon. Earth's natural satellite reached its peak illumination Sunday night. Every full moon has a long list of nicknames, and October's is most frequently referred to as the Hunter's Moon. It got that name because the Hunter's Moon historically signaled to farmers it was time to prepare for a chilly winter ahead. There are two more full moons on the calendar for 2022. On November 8th, we'll see the Beaver Moon, and December 7th will bring the Cold Moon. There are also two more eclipses before we reach 2023, a solar and a lunar. You can leave your eclipse glasses packed away, though, as the solar eclipse is only partial and won't be visible from North America. New Zealand's Wellington Zoo has more than doubled its population of ring-tailed lemurs. That's after its four females gave birth to twins. It's a first. We're all in shock, to be honest. It means that this boy here, this is Zeus, the father, has done his job. <laughs> and, to, job Zeus. and to be honest, he has a tough job because he only has a 24 to 36 hour window oh. while they're in that season and they only breed once a year. So he got around very well. These guys are a big draw card at the moment. Everyone wants to see the baby lemurs. Ring-tailed lemurs are classified as endangered. They can only be found in Madagascar. Wellington Zoo got the lemurs 18 months ago. They got Zeus, their male, at the beginning of 2022. 
they hoped he'd be able to increase their population. Primate manager Lisa Ridley said they were not sure whether they'd have success with breeding. That's because all four adult females were first-time moms. The first set of twins was born in August, and the final set was born last week. The population of ring-tailed lemurs is declining in the wild. One challenge is that females can only get pregnant on one or two days of each year. Let's look at four common kitchen foods that can reduce inflammation naturally. Here's Gina Marie, who brings us Strong Mind and Body. What's the most common cause of illness? inflammation. That's right, many diseases that afflict Western society stem from chronic inflammation. Our poor diets and lack of exercise are major contributors. Let's look at the best foods on offer to combat this problem. Turmeric. This golden spice has been used for millennia, earning its status as a medicinal food. Hundreds of studies have validated turmeric for its anti-inflammatory powers. You can expect good results if you suffer from arthritis, systemic kidney disease, diabetes, heart attack, stroke, obesity, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease and autoimmune disorders. Green tea. This drink appears in multiple studies regarding inflammation. Its anti-inflammatory polyphenols suppress inflammatory enzymes add other benefits like antioxidant, antibacterial, antiviral, antiarthritic and neuroprotective properties. Pomegranate. Pomegranate is a delicious way to combat inflammation. High in polyphenols, it reduces and controls blood sugar levels, stimulating the production of insulin that's important for diabetics. Daily juice consumption is recommended for rheumatoid arthritis and the prevention of free radical damage. Pomegranate also featured in a study of breast cancer treatment and suggested cardioprotective effects. Ginger. Another spice used as traditional medicine from ancient times is ginger. Ginger is commonly employed to combat osteoarthritis, tuberculosis, nausea, including morning sickness, digestive issues and influenza. If you don't have these four common kitchen foods on hand, consider picking them up next time you're at the store. Because as you can see, food can be your medicine. For those of you who count steps on your fitness tracker, we've got your magic number. 8,600 steps a day will prevent weight gain in adults. That's according to new research. That number jumps to 11,000 steps a day for adults who are already overweight but want to have their odds of becoming obese. Researchers followed more than 6,000 people for four years to gather the findings, which were published Monday. Studies show the average person gains one to two pounds every year from young adulthood through middle age. Walking can help prevent that, plus it helps with other conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and depression. The CDC says even moving just 20 minutes a day is highly beneficial to your health. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City.
though, YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform. So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.